What's up, Fungal Associates? Welcome to Completely Arbitrary, the podcast about trees and other related topics. I am one of your hosts. My name is Alex, and I'm sitting across from the man, the legend, the myth, the folkloric figure, Get the folk, the here. folk hero. Hey, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm not the hero you want. I'm just the hero you deserve. Casey Clapp. Yes. That's not how it goes. I'm not the hero you deserve. I'm the hero you want. What is it? What is that? You know what I'm uh, talking about? Yeah, it's, it's from Batman, Batman, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, I'm no hero, Alex. I'm just just a normal guy. I put my pants on one leg at a time. <laughs> uh-huh. Which is what happens when my pants are on. I identify trees. That's right. Wow. How about that? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it was fun. Speaking of tree identification. <laughs> I, I was stunned there because I was like trying to think of... there. That's from something. It just yeah. when I put my pants on, it's... Uh, they're make, they're you know you make gold records yeah what is that it's from uh, the world famous uh, skit with Will Ferrell and uh, oh Christopher Walken oh my god and he's uh, so the, humiliated the Blue Oyster Cult and yes he's playing the cowbell. more cowbell yeah and he goes oh, you're a legend man no 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 I'm not I'm just like you just a normal guy and I remember, I remember that line. I remember like nobody laughing when he said that. <laughs> but it was so good. I actually don't love that sketch. I think oh. I probably did at one point, and then it became a weird sensation. Yeah, it just kind of became one of those like uh, the cult classics, a Blue Oyster cult classic. Yeah, Casey, I did something yesterday that I'm 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 very happy about. Tell us about it as vividly as possible. <laughs> For about a year, I have wanted to do this thing, uh-huh. and yesterday I woke up. And I thought, hey, I'm going to do that thing today. Yeah. And I just did it. I got my nose pierced. I w- blew me away when you told me that you were going to do this. <laughs> I <got> because a... <laughs> I, as you were just about to say, you didn't just get your nose pierced. Yeah. Most people would say, oh, yeah, cool. You got a little like uh, thing on the side. You didn't. No. You went for the middle. Yeah, I got a septum piercing. Rock on. I have a gold ring through my septum now. Dude, how do you like it? I love it. It's something I've wanted to do for so long, and I thought I would look good with it, and I do. Yeah, I agree. I think, though, you should get one of the big ones that's like like kind of gauged, mm. so it's like huge, and it like it looks like a bowl ring coming down. I actually think I shouldn't. Oh, huh. <laughs> that's weird. Anyway, I guess uh, into that conversation now. No, no, you look you look great. <coughs> Thanks, Case. There were a lot of there were a lot of des- cool designs to choose from. Yeah. And I just went with a very basic gold ring. Yeah, I think it's good. It's always nice to start somewhere and then be like, "How am I comfortable with this? Do I like it?" And then yeah. be like, "I kind of want to go do this other thing now." I kind of liked. I kind of you know you we talked you talked about how you don't the idea of stuff happening to your nose is yeah. particularly cringy to yeah, you. I really don't like it. Um, I kind of enjoyed the pain a little bit. I think in the same way what that you enjoy the pain is. of a tattoo. Yeah, there is a, there's a lot of, what is it? It's a, it's a, um, uh, metachlorians in your skin or whatever. <laughs> right. And they, yeah. And once you, once you, you like get a bunch of things, you uh-huh. get like that rush and you're just like, whoo, you become a Jedi. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I usually go out and get a beer and I'm just like, yeah, I'm going to go play darts. Mm. No, I don't actually do that. And your 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 glass is sitting across the table, and you use the force to bring it to your <laughs> hand. Exactly what I do. And out of like, the snowdrift. Yeah, as soon as the bartender notices, I strangle him from afar because I don't <laughs> want him to tell anyone. That's kind of my my kept secret. No, no, Casey's not a Sith. No, no, no. You know what? I'm sick of these rumors that Casey is a <laughs> Sith Lord. Okay, <laughs> this is not the uh, the beer you're looking for. <laughs> Alex, I'm really happy that you did it. Thanks, I, I am too. We're going to have to send pictures out so everyone can see. You know that, right? This is how I do things. I think about them for a year, and yeah. then I wake up one morning out of nowhere and decide <laughs> to do it. Exactly. Welcome to Completely Arbitrary. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Casey, speaking of Completely Arbitrary, on today's episode, like every episode, we're talking mm-hmm. about a tree. That's right. A tree that I don't know much about, but I'm excited Ooh. to talk about. The Judas tree. That's exactly right, Alex, and what a tree it is. Uh, the ultimate betrayer. That is uh, Apparently, but man, we're going to talk about that. This is kind of an interesting thing. Okay, and this is spelled capital J-U-D-A-S hyphen yes. hyphen tree. No, I would say it would be... I this know, is what Google says. You have this this idea, and I'm always so curious about it. When, mm. when someone adds tree to the end of something, yeah. a lot of times you, you think it should just be not that, like the tree's added on. So like a maple tree, you would just say, no, no, it's just a maple. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yes. So in this case, I've always noticed it as the Judas tree. It is the, the you could call it like the tree of Judas, uh, like we would the cedar of Lebanon. It's the, just the Lebanon, Lebanon cedar, cedar you yeah. know? Yeah. So this would be the same kind of thing, except because there's like it's like you're naming the tree for this other thing. It's kind of weird, I guess. Okay, so in the episode title of this episode, in the parentheses where we put the species, uh-huh. will it just say Judas? Judas 
space tree with a yeah. capital T. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think. I mean, that's, that's fine. how we do it. Yeah, like, sort yeah, of, that's our know. that's our our uh, not canon. It's a uh, canon is an idea, but we are talking about religious things, so let's just keep it at, t- at c- canon. Canon. Canaan is a place. Uh, oh my God. Cain and Abel are from the Bible. Oh yeah, there's a whole other version of this. And a cannon is what you shoot balls out of. I, <laughs> I want to say something about this episode. Okay. A couple of different things. All right. One, a, a potential soft trigger warning for uh, suicide by hanging. Yes, correct. Um, two, there was somebody... <laughs> Who left a review on Apple Podcasts for our show oh, yeah? saying they liked it, but they couldn't get into it because we kept talking about Jesus. Oh, do you remember this review? I do. That was a long, that was a long one. It was just about religion, wasn't it? Something yes. Like that? I think specifically, though, it was about Jesus. Okay, yeah. And I, it made me laugh so fucking hard because I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and today, boy, are we really going to lose that listener if they're still with oh, us. Oh, yeah. Kind of, but also kind of not. But yeah, I guess a little bit. Yeah, you're right. Poor listener. Casey, let's imagine that you and I are in a lovely... How about how about this, Case? Ooh, okay. We're on a great vacation. Just mm. you and me. Real romantic. Yeah, this is nice. This sounds good. <laughs> and we come across... We're walking down a boulevard in Greece. Yeah. Uh, uh. I'm eating some Spanakopita. Yep. You are, uh, you, you, we just got chased out of a restaurant because you don't like olives. I know, and they were upset with me, but I, they, they sold me a bottle of wine. So I said, <laughs> and, uh, we come across some Judas trees. We sure do. Let's ID this tree. All right. So, the first thing to know about this tree is in the P family, which is Fabaceae. Curious. Okay. Yeah. So, the the little guy, little tree, only maybe about twenty five feet tall at mm-hmm. max, maybe a little bit taller, um, which is going to come in later. Uh, so it's kind of a shrubby ish tree. Okay. Um, here in the United States, we have a few other species. There's a western one who grows as a shrub. Mm-hmm. There's an eastern one that grows as a tree. We call them here red buds. Oh yeah. You, have you seen this? Do you re- remember? I don't uh, know if I've ever pointed any out. No, I am. I am going. Oh yeah, because somebody. Somebody when it, when I said who can it tree now uh-huh. on this week's uh, Instagram post, yes. I put a little teaser uh-huh. of a, a photo of Jesus and his homies. Yeah, and somebody guessed the red bud, and I was like, "Oh, that's such a that's such a curiously out of left field guess." Yeah, totally. But it was not. That's just another name for the Judas tree. It is. Yeah. We, okay. We would call it like many people call this, and this the scientific name is Circus Siliquastrum. Wow. Siliquastrum. Is that is that related to soliloquy? At no, all? actually I looked that up. I was curious about that because I wanted to know. Yeah. But the specific epithet comes from the word siliqua, meaning pod, and the suffix astrum means partial resemblance. Ah, uh, so re- it, it resembles a pea pod. Yeah, exactly. Which is kind of funny because it is a pea pod. Right. You know, it's in the family and everything. So the resemblance is pretty pretty uncanny you resemble a dendrologist yeah it's like you look just like this guy i know casey (laughs) clap just like him so that and then circus comes from the greek word kirkus uh which means weaver's shuttle apparently because the uh fruit also looks like a a weaver's shuttle i decided not to look that up because i just like the idea of my imagination guessing what a weaver's shuttle is it looks a lot like a space shuttle ah that's what that's exactly what i thought that's why they call it that yeah it's like a weaver's gotta get around somehow you know a space shuttle is sort of weaving space time it really is it's just like it's like the needle that goes between the wormholes (laughs) Yes. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, so this little tree grows over in the Mediterranean, uh, mm. kind of uh, almost the entire Mediterranean, most of the entire top of North Africa and a little bit into the Middle East, Turkey and uh, Greece, the the Balkans. Is it the Balkans? No, the Bal- Balkans, mm-hmm. Baltics. Yes, Balkans. Yes, nice. They always confuse those, and I have to say them out loud so oh, I can remember where they are. Oh, sure. The Baltics are in the north, yes. the Balkans in the south. Okay. So This is the semi-arid uh, climate. Yes, exactly. Uh, we call like the climates in southern Oregon and northern California, right. the interior, especially in southern California, also Mediterranean climates. Yes. So if you are from the opposite place, this would be a Californian climate. Oh. So the, the grass is always greener, isn't it? <laughs> it really is, yeah, whichever way you look at it. <laughs> So this uh, 
it, it's a beautiful tree. The big thing that makes them uh, gorgeous, why we call them red buds, is that they have these beautiful little pea style um, flowers that come out every spring really early in the spring and they come out on the tree and they do the cauliflower. You remember this from the uh, cacao episode. It's Where pronounced the... cauliflower. No, it's a cauliflory. Cauliflory. Yes, it is a kind of um, flowering that comes from the stem and the trunks of a plant. Oh, yeah. yeah. It grows out of the trunk. <laughs> yes, exactly. Rather than the ends of the new shoots, That's which is right. what a lot of plants do, most plants that we ever think of. That's so strange. I yeah. love it. So it looks like you have this entire plant, this entire tree that is covered with a little moss of beautiful little pink purple mm. flowers. And they're really a dark purple pink, these ones. And they, that's why they're kind of so stunning. People mm. plant them all over the place. Um, at least, well, over here, we actually plant the eastern redbud in Oregon and then uh, mostly in the, the northwest. But if you were over in Europe, you probably would see this tree way more often. Is eastern redbud, now eastern redbud is, is the same species as the Judas tree? No, different species, same genus. The okay. eastern one is Circus canadensis. So what is the what is the what do we call the Judas tree here that is the same species? We would probably call it the Mediterranean red bud. Oh, yeah, so okay. that's another name for it. And eastern is in relation to the United States, so the eastern red bud grows on the east coast of the U.S. Yes, and then the western red bud or the California red bud goes out here, and I believe that Circus occidentalis. I think. Oh my god! Yeah, so it's very confusing. Uh, just like you'd say the the. Uh, uh, Western things, it depends on where the person was or who they were when they were describing it, you know? Sure. Yeah, so it's a little bit of a, it's a, little bit of a problem. The West is only called the West because it was, it was called that by Westerners. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of this really goes back to like Roman times where yeah. the Romans were centered in Rome, then they were centered in Constantinople, so there was an East and a West. Right. But if you were a Persian, everything over there was a West, and then you were maybe the very center of the world. But then if you were... Um, the Chinese, then you would say, well, everything over there is West, but we're the center of the world. So East is, you know, nothing. So yeah. you would just be center. East would be the ocean. Oh, that's interesting, Casey. So it's, there's a lot of different uh, interpretations depending on how far you go back. Yeah. But that will come into play later, in fact, Alex, mm. into our conversation is these different cultural and religiosities, uh, religious cults, so to speak, that were founded in different cultures in certain areas and how that that religion and those cultures have kind of come through. But, Alex, I digress. A little tease for later. Just a little tease. So the rest of this tree is uh, all leaves after that. So you have the, mm. the flowers that come out early spring before the leaves. They cover the entire tree, and then slowly but surely they kind of fade away, and these little heart-shaped chordate leaves come out, alternately arranged along the stem. By the way, chordate? is heart-shaped. Exactly. Did you say that? Uh, not this time, no. Okay, maybe I'm I said heart-shaped cord. No, I, I think maybe you said heart-shaped cord. Might have yeah, I might have done that. My apologies. Hey, what, I, no, you're good to connect these dots. Thank you. Um, but the leaves of the, uh, of the Judas tree, they don't have a very pointed tip. They have a very, very slow tip and then a very slow down. Like um, I would say the angle of the tip is very obtuse rather than okay. very acute. Sure. So it makes it look like they're more rounded than anything, but they do have a tiny little tip on them. And they really have this like gorgeous brownish bark. And I like this bark because when it's on young trees, it almost looks like it's speckled brown. Hmm. Like almost more like the speckle is just a texture where it's just a textured brown bark. Yeah. It's not very like harsh. It doesn't really hurt you, but if you if you grab onto it, but it just has these very, very light textureness to it that makes it look like it kind of pops out a little bit at you. Kind of the way that matte kind of looks like it pops a little bit more than a gloss sort of thing, in my opinion at least. Oh, sure. I'm looking at the... It reminds me of something. Yeah, well, it does. It's striking, and I can't quite place you know, what it is. Yeah. But it looks very finished to me. Yeah. But then as the bark gets a little bit older, it's kind of interesting because it turns a little bit more gray and looks very, very rough and tumble. Like, it looks like utility bark to every degree. Yeah. But it still is like... It's like all those little tiny texture on the brown bark just kind of slowly but surely get a little bit bigger, but the texture is still very fine. So it's a fine barked tree with this really interesting uniform pattern going all the way down to the bottom. 
Interesting. I just love it. I think the bark is a delightful, delightful bark. Oh, it's got sort of that, um, it almost reminds me of like a cherry bark. Mm, a yes. little bit, without yeah. the big lenticels. I can see that, yeah. Lenticels being those those horizontal strips or the, the, the little air bubbles or fart pockets that come out. <laughs> yes, the yeah. fart pockets. So, Thank you. You're welcome. I knew you were going to say it if I didn't, so I wanted to beat you to the punch there. I actually wasn't. You know, what? Now I've just been shanghai to talking like you. It was going to happen sometime, I guess. Oh, God. So the last thing about this tree is that the, the same place that the flowers come from, the fruit comes from. So you have these little pea pods that start to come down, and wherever those flowers were, once they are pollinated, they then become the fruit, of course. And then you get this tree that is now festooned with these long pea pods covering yeah. all the branches and sometimes on the trunk itself. They look like big insect wings. Yeah, they do. That's a really good description. And what's cool is that if you then wait a whole other year, mm -hmm. when it flowers again, a lot of times those same little uh, pods will be hanging with new flowers coming out right between them because they last basically the entire winter time. Oh, wow. So you get this really cool effect of like these these long hangy things with these flowers like kind of on the on the top of them. So it's kind of like this long hangy beard with this like little moss covered branch, but the moss is actually these like pink purple flowers. I want anyway. I want to say so far, you know mm -hmm. when like um you go to a, go to a restaurant, yeah, and the chef is like, and the chef is like young and idealistic, uh -huh. and you know, talented, uh huh. But they like they'll have like a dish that has like, oh, it's this, oh, that sounds great, but we have we added this to it, oh, like, oh okay, interesting. I guess that could be good, okay. And it comes with a side of this, and you're like, oh, okay. That's a lot happening. But hold on. Instead of making it a side, we just put it on top. Yeah. It's part of the dish. Plus, we added plums. And you're like, oh, man, this sounds like shit now. Yeah, like, man, if you just take away the plums and separate everything else. Yes. Give okay. me give me one of these things. Give me just ah. a nice, a good risotto, not with plums and all this shit. <laughs> so so you're saying, Alex, that mm -hmm. this tree is, is maybe a little bit much for you right now. It's a little extra. It's just Ooh. like try, it's trying too much, too many things at once. Oh, it's like I it's see. got flowers growing out of the bark. Oh, that's, that's cool. And it's got really interesting, attractive utility bark. Oh, that's cool. And it's got these really crazy, wacky pea pods. Oh, Oh, okay. And then uh, if the, sometimes the pea pods and the flowers are on the same the same time, then there's a bark and there's the flowers and the pea pods. And it's just too much, Casey. <laughs> He's just going insane over there. Alex, take a breath. Oh, my God. I don't dislike it for all that, but I just, I look at it, I judge it. You're thinking that the tree is, is just calm down. Yeah. Take it one step at a time. I like do one thing really well. Yeah. Well, Alex, this tree does do one thing very well. Mm. And I think if I was to say what it was, it would be flowering. Okay. I think the flowers are are by far the best thing. Yeah. Whenever I see an eastern red bud planted here, it is just always so gorgeous. Yeah. And I have not really paid close attention to the trees that I see here. So I very well may have seen a lot of the Judas tree or the Circus siliquastrum out there in the world without actually knowing it. Just be like, wow, well, it's another red bud and just kind of moved on. Sure. Because I know that they're planted here. If they do well over in that region, they certainly do well in this region. Mm where we have that same kind of climate where it's very wet winters and then very mild, usually very mild winters that turn into a very dry and mild summer. So we'll see if I can spot a couple of those uh, here coming down the future. After my rant, I do want to give a quick cross and stump of approval to the flowers. Hey, there we go. Kaplunk. Mm. Kaplunk. Nope. Kashunk. Uh, incorrect. I forgot. Fagoosh. Fagoosh. Dang it, Alex. <laughs> All my words change so quickly. Fagoosh. You evolve. Yes. That's fine. Hey, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I love a little flower in big clumps. Yeah, okay. That's, okay. I love that. Yeah, I like this one because I, I like that it's covered entirely yeah. with the flowers. That's I think pretty, that's really unique. It's pretty goofy. It's like the wolf man. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's just like, man, you grew flowers everywhere? That's okay. <laughs> All right. That's that's a lot. Good job. Okay, uh, okay. Move on. 
Yeah. So the the funny thing, what's interesting is, uh, why is this tree called the Judas tree? Have yes. you done any research on this? Uh, only a little, Casey, and it's pretty startling. Yeah. Okay. What did you find? Here's where our here's where our uh, trigger warning comes into effect. <laughs> yeah. It, it is purported mm-hmm. through scientific journals <laughs> 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 that this is the species of tree by which. Judas, Mm -hmm. uh, what's his last name? Iscariot. Iscariot hung himself, hanged himself Mm -hmm. post uh, betrayal of his homie Jesus. Yes, that is the legend. Yeah. A legend. Yes. Uh, There is an alternative, uh, which is that the the fruit the those hanging pea pods mm-hmm. they hang in a way that <laughs> represents it oh my god yeah so that's that's another one that is not as wholesome as i thought the alternative to the first one was going to be <laughs> well okay let me give you another uh oh, another another I, alternative I, well i know i might oh, know this alternative okay what's this one is that the the it's it's named for the the blood of the red color of the flowers <laughs> is the blood of Judas. That's part of the first one, I think. Oh, okay. I hadn't heard Truthfully, that. Truthfully, yeah. But no, no, that's not it. Okay. My, the last one is, is way, way nicer. Okay. Uh, where the, the, the French name for this plant. Oh, yes. Did you, did you read this one? Yes, yes, yes. Arbe, Arbe de Jude. Yes. Arbe. Oh, here come our French-speaking listeners. Sorry, everyone. Anyone from Canada is probably like, shut the hell up. (laughs) Canada? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know how many people in French listen to us, but yeah, you know there's at least some uh, French Canadians. Shout out to all of our French Canadian fans. Hell yeah. Um, Anyway, it means tree of Judea. Yes. Which Judea is the ancient area that is what now is Israel where the Jews are initially from. Yes. And this is back when Judea was like more of a city state in the same that like Athens and Sparta were a yeah. city state. And then over, you know, over the decades and years, Persia took it over. And then I think after that, the Romans took it over. I know after that, the Romans took it over. This feels like the least sensationalized origin. Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, you would say, you know, it's the the Judea tree. And then they'd say, oh, it's a Judas tree. And it would just kind of slowly get corrupted, yeah. right? So that's honestly, and I, I think this for a couple reasons, that that's the actual name. Yeah. Because there's a lot of different pea family plants. And there's a lot of things that have hangy fruit yeah. that no one has ever been like, that reminds me of Judas Iscariot. Yeah. And I had said already before that the tree is only like 25 feet tall. So maybe there could be a big one, but honestly, even if he did try, he probably would have hit the ground before he actually like, oh my God. you know, before the rope went taut, let's say. Sure. So I don't think that this is even a tree that's substantial enough to really, you know really make it happen. This is our first lost episode. Yeah, sorry you guys. We're <laughs> going to move on past this. So I think that the I think that is probably a, a corruption of the French word yes. for it, the arbre arbre de All right, the tree of Judea. Judea. I think you're probably right, Casey. I, I agree with you there. I it's isn't that always the case though? It's like the least the least interesting one is yeah. the is the real one. It usually is, yeah. The least yeah. in session. I'm listening to another podcast about Roman history, which I, I have to tell everyone to listen to because I'm digging it. You the, you you've the said I've I'm listening to this podcast <laughs> like for the last two years. I know, dude. It's so long. How is this is this that like every week is yeah. a week in the history of Rome no. in real time? Uh, Do you no, know that one? No, no, but this might be the same one. They just it's so long and they put it out every week. Yeah. He does, it's one guy so it it might be that everyone just thought that but it is it it moves much faster than that okay but each episode is only half hour and he is very thorough but not too thorough oh yeah sorry everyone (laughs) what are we at now the 45 minute mark already (laughs) so yeah anyway it's a very long and and very uh very specific journey yeah and i think i'm probably like halfway through i think they did that for like six or seven years that's how long this whole thing is. Anyway. Holy shit. I don't even remember why I said that, but... The, you just wanted to talk about it. I just it. want to talk about it. Anyway, the we got to talk about this tree, but I have to admit, Alex, huh. we are, we're talking about this tree in more of a metaphorical sense. Right. So this is a little bit... It's, I know we had some people say, hey, I noticed you guys just kind of talk about a tree, then just take a left turn, talk about something completely different, we, we, and then come back. We totally admit sometimes we do that. Yes. This might be one of those times. <laughs> if, if that upsets you, <laughs> you know... <laughs> 
Sorry. Keep listening because this is going to be a very interesting conversation. Yes. It's a subject that has been close to my heart for many years. I took a class in this uh, and read this article a decade and a half ago. Yeah. And it kind of changed my whole idea of how the world works. And there's a couple other books that have like been, you know, influential, but this is one of the uh, the the main subjects that have really pushed me over. And this tree, I thought, would be a good tree to pair with this. And the subject is religion and ecology. Yes. And the reason I think it's interesting is that uh, in religion and ecology, per what we're going to talk about in like five minutes, is the idea that these sort of this metaphor and the actuality of reality kind of come together at some point and become the same thing. Mm. And that I think happened with this tree where it's kind of been vilified. Like it has this horrible name where a lot of people are like, yeah, this, this guy hung himself in this tree. This, this tree represents the, the guy that betrayed Jesus who thousands and millions of people around the world, like absolutely deify. And I mean that in the most literal sense. <laughs> so, it is a uh, it's a tree that like has this weird myth whether or not it deserves it whether or not it meant to be that has come in to be reality now the name that we're using for it because it's a very common name for it is the Judas tree so that that sort of metaphorical kind of overlapping of of name and in myth and religion and uh, actual reality kind of comes together how does it manifest? Well, religion and ecology, the subject we're going to talk about in five minutes, manifests itself in a way that it's is... It's four minutes now. Oh, shoot. Has it been that long? It manifests its way, Alex, in such a mind-blowing way to me. At least I... This is what the argument is I will provide. Yes. Whereas this tree manifests its way into the point where everyone's like, nah, who cares? It's a really beautiful tree. Yeah. So I kind of dig that. And I always like putting those things together where like on one end, uh, we're talking about this tree and how it's sort of uh, played this role. On the other end, we're talking about this other role that this completely different idea kind of has put together and changed the rest of the world. And that one, the whole world has changed. The other one, it's like, nah, who cares? It's a beautiful tree. Sure. Kind of dig that as a, as a juxtaposition. You can say I don't really I didn't follow that. You didn't follow I'm sorry, that? Casey. <laughs> we should just uh we should just go right into it. <laughs> I'm sorry. That is that's all right. I'm leaving all that in though because <laughs> just cuz I didn't follow it doesn't mean other people won't. Well, let's take a break. Let's grab some water. And yeah. Then, Alex, buckle up. Wow. We'll be right back with more completely arbitrary. Welcome back to Completely Arbitrary. Today we're talking the Judas tree. Oh boy, this scientific name. Circus Silicastrum. <laughs> okay. Siliquastrum. Circus Siliquastrum. Can... Yes, correct. Okay. Now, I'm going to just check this. Siliquastrum. Okay, I got that right. Remember when we talked about... Kind of a goofy uh, one, huh? What, what was it? It was salicylic acid yeah and i kept doing salicyl salicylic oh salicidic salicidic acid yeah i think that's what i did and someone okay. messages like dude you guys read <sighs> they didn't miss they were very kind they're like hey you're saying it wrong the whole time thumbs up okay <laughs> anyway we're gonna move on that sounds like passive aggression i'm not here for it, <laughs> it wasn't i thought it was nice um, you always read <laughs> passive aggression as somebody just being nice casey well, you give people too much credit i'm sorry well, okay well maybe maybe that's maybe that's fair but you're just that kind of guy. It's a nice worldview for me. You have a yes, no. It, I I I am of course being, but uh, uh, I'm being uh, facetious. You're being uh, aggressively aggressive. I like I like that about you, oh, and it, it only you. makes me angry because I wish I could be that way. I <laughs> know, uh, but when your eyes are open, your eyes are open, Alex. If you see it the way it actually is, rather than me being blinded by the facade of the passiveness, yeah, then you're you're as kind of heavy as the heavy as the head. I you know? see. You're the giver. You 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 see everything and you shield it from everybody else. <laughs> Isn't that the and right I, book? I, I shake my head at Casey and I go, yeah. "Poor fool, <laughs> poor fool." Yeah, I'm just living my happy-go-lucky life over here. Yeah, Alex, must of, be nice. <laughs> it isn't. Not no, a, I'm just joking. It's, it's not a I'm, not a drop of mental illness <laughs> in you, is there? No, of you course not. Fucking... Look at me. I'm <laughs> I'm a definition of 
I'm a I, yes. Anyway, we should move on. We won't. We won't. Uh, we won't. Um, <laughs> we won't diagnose you on air. Okay. Yeah. I think don't. we. Sh- I think we. At some point, we should. So I'm sure someone already has our two year anniversary. We should really <laughs> dig into <laughs> That's Casey Clap. It was a four hour episode. Everybody <laughs> cried. It was. It was really intense. God bless you, Case. As you as well. Thank you, friend. Now, speaking of God, Alex, in the beginning, God made everything. I have heard this. This is the creation myth that is in Genesis, that is in the Old Testament, which is the Hebrew Bible. Yes. Uh, The Torah. So, uh... A quick Wait, history. the Torah is the Hebrew is just the is just old the Old Testament. I'm pretty sure. I think there's other stuff in there. Oh, okay. Uh, but yeah, essentially, Old Testament plus. Yeah, I think that's I think that's correct. Don't quote me on this. I sh- here's a big big fat disclaimer. This goes for both of us. I am not a theologian. We are not here to discuss theology no. in a strict sense, though we are technically talking about it in some regard. Yeah. Uh, but also, we are not historians, and we're not going to talk about uh, dogma and things like this. So here's some history and theology for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the main thing being that uh, if I get something wrong, uh, you can feel free to call us out on it. We'll be like, well, thanks. Uh, did we get the scientific name wrong i mm. think so anyway turning into my side yes exactly i'm not i'm not a, i'm not a bad guy i love our listeners no oh, yeah i'm very long. grateful yeah of course it's just like right. there's like a handful of people i can't stand ah uh, yeah yeah the we want only praise if you send one thing <laughs> <laughs> i didn't have to say it <laughs> anyway so here's what we're going to talk about. We can't be around this bush, Alex. We got to we got to jump straight mm, into this it. burning bush. Exactly. Oh my God, it's on fire. It, is it a tree or is it more of a burning shrub? Wow, that's a really a question that we have to ask. Mm. So, um, the idea of religion and ecology was initially created by this guy named Lynn White in 1967. He wrote this article, and the article is kind of innocuously titled. The historical roots of our ecological crisis. Yes. Now, Casey, I read this article. Yes, you did. What did you think? Uh, I thought it was fascinating, and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna intersperse my thoughts as we go. Please do. Um, but I was I was impressed with myself for reading a nine page uh, scientific article. Yeah, Not you did scientific, a really good job. You know. I think it is. It was I mean, it was published in Science. I think it it counts as a scientific article. Okay. Yeah, it's just more of the philosophical sort rather than the original research sort. Sure. So it's it, commenting on some some other work that's already yeah, been done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think there there was I'm sure I'm sure certainly he could have I, the the what I have a PDF that just uh, says where it was published. It doesn't have any citations or anything. Mm. So I don't know if it officially has. But uh, Lynn White is a uh, medieval historian. Yeah, that's that's what he did. And so he would have cited like these different historical primary texts for you know different things that he's talking about here. But the main thing that Lynn White talked about was he essentially, without uh, without actually aiming to, like, he wasn't, like, saying, I'm going to go figure this out. He kind of just stumbled upon this sort of, like, realization is what it kind of feels like. And mm. I've read a couple other um, kind of articles discussing it, and a lot of people have probably read this article if they have done any sort of um, environmental ethics course or an environmental philosophy or something like that. Okay. I first read this in a course at the University of Oregon called Religion and Ecology. Mm. And I was very fascinated. I was like, well, what, what does that mean? How does that even come together? And it was this weird sort of uh, philosophical course that was not necessarily all philosophy. It was kind of, it was in the folklore department, I think. So it had like this uh, this mythicalness to the course where it's kind of, you're talking about squishy things that aren't necessarily like, here's a fact, here's a fact, here's a fact. Yeah. And this is the uh, the paper that started that entire kind of, uh, discipline. Long story short, what he argues is that the entire ecological crisis that we're dealing with today, and he wrote this in 1967, so it was then as well, he says, is basically because we have, since medieval times and prior to that, um, taken the words of the Bible and this sort of Judeo-Christian ideology of um, God created man in his likeness. God is transcended above the earth, above nature. Yeah. Therefore, people are also transcended and above and different from nature and created this dualism. He then said, you are to be dominant and take dominion over the land. 
Whoops. And essentially has said, or it's been interpreted, at least this is what White is arguing, everything on the world, on the land, including the world itself, is there for humans by God. Yeah. And we can do with it as we please because it's there for us. Uh. It is. It's it's a hard guy like, thing to, to, to look at. And if you have any sort of environmental ethic that's like, no, things are good, then you're like, well, yeah, but is it good for you? for us, for itself? What's, what exactly are you arguing? Yeah. And so he says, and he draws very nice, uh, it's nine pages, which for a philosophical kind of text is actually really short. Um, <laughs> That's funny because <laughs> <laughs> you sent that to me. I was like, nine fucking pages? <laughs> yeah, I've read like 25 page documents where it's just like they go on oh and on and on about these things in like really God. hard hard language to follow. Thank you for doing all the research for this podcast, Casey. <laughs> I really welcome. appreciate it. It's my pleasure. So um, what they basically talk talked about is or what he's arguing is that be way back when um plows were going to be one way and then uh you can only kind of scratch the surface in a literal sense of the the ground yes so then he said well the technology changed and then once the technology changed we started to be able to take ourselves out of a subsistence living situation and start to make more of everything once we could make more land, we started basically saying, well, we don't need to live within the bounds of what the earth will let us do. We are no longer part of it. We can actually take it and just do whatever we want. We can plow the hell out of everything and make a massive amount of food and alter just about everything we could. What I, what I, I the, specifically, he says something about how in the, in the Near East uh-huh. at the time, was you know what, what would that be called uh modern day oh yeah modern day turkey and greece yeah yeah, yeah. it's where the, where the soil is uh, a little drier yeah and harder to get through mm-hmm. that like you said that the plows were just sort of like barely cutting it in, into the earth yeah exactly when that technology reached uh northern europe mm-hmm uh, where the soil is i think he said s- s- more sticky, sticky yeah um they they uh, were able to really gash into this yeah, earth. Really went for it. And multiplied the number of oxen they used from two to eight. Yeah. And like he, he said, he called it some, something about uh, a violent uh, kind of change in yeah. farming philosophy. It, well, it was, and what was interesting is that that violent change was also. Uh, a technological change. Yeah. Where, and he makes this <clears throat> distinction between technology and uh, and sort of philosophy or like high-minded thinking. So like, who were the people doing scientific thinking? They were the aristocrats. Yeah. They didn't care about what was happening down below. The the down below people were their hands in the soil, the, the peasants. They had technology because it was like, we need to make this bigger, better. Their brains were thinking, how do I make this plow work better for me? Yeah, technology's blue collar. Yeah, exactly. And so all of a sudden, he said, like over you know a certain period of time, and well, if, for those of you who just want to press pause, go read this article, and then come back. It'd be worth it, probably. It would be totally worth it. It's only nine pages. And it's on our website if you need help finding it, uh, arbitrarypod.com. Go to this episode's show notes, yes. and there will be a link to it there. So, um, so basically, long story, a little bit short because it's already getting pretty long. Mm. Um, he makes the, the thing that because we are predisposed with this sort of really fundamental kind of religious ideology of the land is here for us, go have dominion over it, that we started to essentially – use this technology in order to get the leg up on nature. And then people who were doing the scientific thinking at the time, the the high up theologian scientists, they were thinking, well, we want to figure out what how these things work, not because we're we're trying to, you know, figure out how it works for its own sake. I think one of the quotes is like, I want to hear what God had to say, or I want to see like the steps that God took right after he took them. Mm. And that is them like trying to figure out, well, what does a rainbow look like? Rather than uh like you were saying in the East, and this is again the east of of essentially Constantinople or east of at least Italy. So it's kind of that the the, the Middle East, the Mesopotamia kind of region as well as Judea and as well as Greece, they were saying, well, if you see this thing, this creek, this rainbow, this natural feature, 
it is uh, it's a thing from God saying, hey, look, there's this cool thing, and you kind of are like, hey, great, I, I like that. Whereas in the West, it's more like, I wonder why, I wonder how, yeah. what can we use? How does this work so that we can use it to our advantage or we can do something with it? And so he ends up making this big thing, and he argues before that the entire, all of our technology is all Western technology. No matter where it started at the beginning, it is now in our modern sense, Western technology, almost across the board. And so his argument basically says, because of this initial religious belief, this initial theological sort of um, free pass and transcendent dualism that humans are not a part of nature, we can do with it as we please, as we had the technology, as we had the ideas and the scientific thinkers, once those came together in the industrial revolution, mm -hmm. it basically put everything into overdrive. And now the earth and everything is just completely destroyed because who cares? It's ours to use as we please. It doesn't exist for its own sake. And that is his kind of big fundamental argument about where we are now and why the roots of our ecological crisis actually go all the way back to essentially uh, medieval and pre-medieval theology and how that has been taken literally, which yeah. is, you know, why it's like, we should do the Judas tree, because it is taken literally as this thing when it probably actually wasn't. Yeah. So they say, take dominion, and that's a translation from the initial Hebrew, from the initial Greek, from the initial Latin, and now to English. So it's kind of like, well, what was it actually supposed to be? Did it really mean this? But now we have seen it this way, and now we take it that way. So this, con this conceivably more of a either lost in translation or a metaphor of like you, you know, God made you in earth. You are now here. Go do things. It kind of just solved this question of like, where did we come from? That's been taken literally. And now because it's been taken literally, we are in this gigantic mess. And he argues that we can't get out of this mess. Mm -hmm. We cannot solve it by technology and science alone because it's still within that same paradigm. We need a religious shift. That's exactly what he said. Like, we have to change our religion. Yeah. Which is crazy, like, to think about. Like, it, But it's also one of those things where you ask yourself, we're in the middle of climate change. We're, we've been in it for a long time. Since here, he also notes in this 1967 article, he's like, wow. And uh, we're getting a lot more information about all these other things. It's coming in every day. We are now living 50 years on from when he put this out. And we're right now like, wow, what has changed? It's like nothing has changed. <clears throat> Almost nothing has changed. It's just gotten worse and worse pretty yeah, much. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> Not <laughs> every We have made progress, I will say. Uh, you know, the Clean Air Act and you know things like this. Yeah. You know, we've, we've made changes, but the, the long-form trajectory, right, still pretty much the same. Yeah. Here's a question. What do you got? If all of this stems from the idea that we as people are not a part of nature, uh -huh. that we are two separate things. There is nature and then there is humankind. Yeah. Is paganism a form of activism? Yeah, it might be. Now, we should make one distinction that paganism is is a lo it's a lowercase p, right? Right. Paganism is many things. Exactly. It's not like one thing called paganism. It's essentially just not... Christian monotheism. Okay, good, good, good distinction. I guess I was saying paganism in the sense of uh, of being more closely related to nature and ex yeah. coexisting as as opposed to taking so, dominion over. Yes, exactly. Maybe what you're thinking is more uh, the idea that he brings up and other people have is animism. Yes, animism. That's okay. that's what I was. I think that's what I was thought I was saying. Yeah. I remember reading that in the article. Yeah, and so for those of you who are not familiar, it's the idea that kind of everything. Um, has its own spirit. Specifically, it has a spirit in the old kind of European Roman Greek fashion where they said, well, this is actually like, there's a spirit that is of this that kind of guards it. And you have to, I think he said, placate that spirit in yeah. order to use that resource, you know? Before chopping down the tree. Yeah. You placate the spirit of the tree. Exactly. And then he goes on to make the argument that as um, sort of the Christianization of the Roman Empire and the rest of Europe after that, they would go and chop down these sacred groves. Yeah. So having this sort of sacred grove of um, of anything or having like say this river is sacred for this reason that puts a spirit an agency into that river right. which is 
it, which is heretical towards Christianity. If you're monotheistic, nothing. There is only one spirit, exactly, uh, and it's not in that tree. So no. go wild, go chop them all down. Exactly, it has nothing. It, like it has no spirit. Yeah. So it's it just is. It's one of those mind blowing kind of things to me. And there are some cri- critiques to it. I should add that, that <laughs> to this paper. Yeah, where mm. some people have said, well, dominion is one one interpretation. There's also like stewards. You are a steward of of creation you yeah know? um where they say you know it's it still keeps that dualism though it's kind of one of those issues where there's there's us and everything else yeah where it's like oh well we are stewards we're not to take dominion and destroy it we're supposed to maintain it and keep it you know there but it still is for us yeah. So it's an interesting thing. I actually had a critique come up to me for this um, because it also, I, you've heard me, we've talked about urban forestry for a, a million things. And I mm-hmm. say, oh, trees are important. And here's why. They provide us these ecosystem services. That is still within this same sort of um, problematic ideology because I'm not saying plant that tree because that tree should be planted or it matters or don't cut that tree down because it matters in and of itself. You're saying plant that tree because we benefit. Exactly. Yeah. So that I think would still be like a red flag saying, no, 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 you still are not getting the point. Yeah. But I also think like that's halfway there. It is. I think that's at least fair. Yeah. At least you're getting somewhere, right? Yeah. So this is, uh, it's one of those fundamental things that have come up. And so the reason that, um, A, we wanted to do the Judas tree with this is just because uh, when we were talking about like the idea of Christianity being this sort of, well, really it's the Judeo-Christian. It's the whole sort of um, that base religious text that's come up because those religions came from each other. Initially it was Judaism from the people and the city of Judea, which is also a really fascinating thing, Alex. Mm. It's a quick side note. Mm. Uh, The city-state idea where there's just like the people of Judea were Jews and they were they had their religion of their people. Yeah, it wasn't. Uh, it, it wasn't until the city was completely destroyed, uh, which it was several times by the Romans, because they were just a problematic people for the Romans. Mm. That then you got the uh, the Jewish diaspora, which then became they just became people all over the the Roman Empire and things. Because those people seek refuge all over yeah. the place. Yeah, they basically said, "Well, our city's literally leveled; it does not exist anymore. We're gonna we have to go to this city and that city and this city and over there." And but over they bring there, their there. they bring their religion and their culture. With yeah, them. exactly. Yeah. And as so, you do. It, as you do, and then uh, Christianity is one of the first religions that never had an actual like people place that started uh, you know in one area. Area. The city of Christ. <laughs> exactly. There was. There is none of that. <clears throat> and it's always interesting how uh, people and their culture and their place and their religion are all one thing. Yeah. You, it's not like you can you make a choice. It's like, oh, these are the gods I believe in. It's one of the most fascinating things I think about world and and ancient history specifically. It's like a company that started in the Zoom era. Uh. So everybody's what? remote. <laughs> And they know no other way. They don't have a building you can all go to. <laughs> okay, yeah. Where headquarters? Everyone's like, um, I, I don't know. The My, internet here? The the ether? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. I'd really, I had to really take a left turn to figure out what you're talking about there. <laughs> My well, specialty. <laughs> anyway, so the the Judas tree is a tree of Judea. It is of this place, and it's like this. Um, it, for me, it just feels like it, it kind of is is this another metaphor. I'm not sure if I can even put my finger on like where it came from, other than like that tree seemed like the good one to do. And it seems like when you think about our this this issue of where you started with this metaphor, it's become reality, and now it is this unspoken unidentified thing that is pushing us all this one direction. Yeah. Even if you are like, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a religious by any means. I don't believe in that. He would argue that you are still a part of the, the overall culture. So yeah. you, you can't really escape it. But, um, so long story short, I want to make sure to kind of pull this back to the tree, I guess is what I'm saying. I don't want that to come up, but I'm sure it will. I <laughs> don't. <laughs> Casey, <laughs> We have full creative <laughs> autonomy oh, over this podcast. Thank you, you. <laughs> you don't need to feel an ounce of insecurity about that. I really appreciate you. And all of you listeners out there who are like, yeah, Casey, you, just, you keep going, buddy. Yeah. It's, you know, it, for me, it works on the most surface level thematics. Ah, uh, yeah. That's that true. It's, <laughs> it's completely passable. Okay, great. 
<laughs> Alex, what do you think? I've talked a lot. Um, yeah, I well, I, I I encourage anybody. I mean, even even the Alexes out there to read this article. It's pretty fucking fascinating. Yeah. Um, there were a few lines. This is the, I have to, I have to look at. I cannot pull up information the way you can, Casey, from my brain <laughs> after reading something. Okay. I have to reference it. Um, so. I, my my favorite takeaway, and this is not, I almost I don't treat this as a spoiler, but mm. um, uh, where is it? What are you going to spoil? <laughs> <laughs> well, did you know in 1830, Saint <laughs> Francis? Yes. Can you sort of dig into this just a little bit before we get to our review? Oh, absolutely. That is uh, that is one of the most fascinating things. I, I've, I'm not a religious man, but if there is like a cult, like in the, yeah. in the ancient Greek sense for St. Francis, I might hop on board. Oh, yeah, for sure. So St. Francis, uh, the Franciscans, Franciscans. Yes. Franciscans? Um, I think Franciscans, yeah, maybe that's the right way to of, say Of San it. Francisco? Yes, I think it's them, the San Franciscos. Yeah, because, well, no, that's St. Francisco, isn't it? Or is St. Francis? They just, oh, my God. Is, there's no way to tell. There's no way to tell. We, we have to move on. Um, so St. Francis of Assisi is a, um, he was a, he's a saint. And basically, he's the one person who basically argued um, that we should actually be like looking at these other things. They have agency and spirit of their own where each individual thing, each uh, non-living and living entity was doing whatever it does in celebration of God. Yes. So I think an example given in the the article is... Uh, a, he would a bird would flap its wings because it's like I, it's praising God because God created it and so it's doing its part. Right. A flame, a fire, a stream, everything is doing whatever it does innately because that's what it does. But that is a celebration of God. And so he became a person that at the time they kind of made fun of him because he was like, you know, preaching to different birds and animals and things. Yeah. But I think that a lot of people have said he was kind of doing that ironically. So it's kind of this, oh. this weird thing because he was, he was doing it ironically in the sense of like, um, he's like, you guys are so stupid. I'm going to go preach to these birds right now. I see. So he'd preach to the birds to be like, yeah, see, that bird's doing this. You guys are idiots. It's like, performance stop. art. Yeah, he was doing that and people kind of... but. People listened to him. They were kind of like, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah. they, they, at the time, uh, there's certain things that you have to give the people credit for because they're like, well, I have to do this to survive. This ancient period is an insane place, <laughs> yeah. like to say the least. So you have to kind of like play everything by ear. No one was making these decisions in their brain. They just kind of like said, yeah, this is how it is. This is what happens. Mm -hmm. Now we're kind of able to look back and be like, oh, look at that. Look at that big old long pattern. And he's the only person, St. Francis, that pops out from that pattern. Yeah. That he said, actually, everything has its own sort of uh, ability to praise God in its own way. So you end up getting this person who basically got vilified because he gave everything else spirits, and that was heretical. So he's been like the church historically. I don't know if now, but way back then, they kind of like said, "Shut up, stop, stop." stop kind of like really pushed him pushed him off to the side i'm not being facetious when i say what little i know of saint francis to me he comes across as an artist ahead of uh, his time yeah i think you're probably right yeah um who just was not understood but was brilliant and was doing something really important and cool yeah but nobody listened because it was not the status quo yeah isn't that isn't that always the way it is cassandra's of all time a bit of a kaufman character yeah casey i think this is a good point to get into our review of the judas tree i think that's a great idea alex Here's how it works. We'll give some final thoughts on this tree and then give it a rating of 0 to 10. Golden cones of honor. Mm -hmm. Ancient golden cones. Yes. Casey, as our resident theologian, <laughs> we will start with you. Uh, I'm going to start. Every time you say something and you add it to my my name, uh -huh. I'm going to add that to my like epithets that I have. <laughs> and I think that would be a lot of fun. Or maybe I'll take the Roman the Romanness to it. And so every time I do something successfully, mm. like argue some theological thing i'll just tack that onto my name so now i'm like casey clap theologist yes dendrologist or, yes uh, din, no it's more like dendra din dendra dendrosius something dendrosius. like that yeah. yeah it'd have to be something like that 
All right, anyway, sorry, everyone who doesn't like this, just just go back and, and don't listen to this episode. Anyway. Casey. <laughs> we're just, it's such a, a fun ramble in ancient history where I'm like, this is, this is fun. Th- this I'm having a great time. This will be great. <laughs> so um, so here's my, here's my take on the Judas tree. It is uh, a tree that for me uh, harkens this very strange space where I put it, where I'm like, you represent something. I can't explain why, mm. but I see you as this intertwining thing between this, this weird sort of religious uh, connotation, which you may or may not deserve, but then the reality is that you have it. Like, it, that's right. just what it is. So in the sense of religion and ecology, I don't blame the religions for necessarily making this happen because they're like, we don't care, we want to destroy the earth, all for us. It was a, it was a thing, they were just like, they were trying to live, you know, they, they just had to do it. Now we're looking back, we're like, man, look at this big problem that we have, and it's our fundamental ideology that is causing it. Hmm. Um, it's, these, it's this weird kind of, kind of thing. However, uh, I think that makes it a tragic tale. I think the whole thing is a, it's a tragedy. Uh, in the Greek sense of a tragedy, the protagonist does not overcome the conflict. Yeah. So the the our world and our ideology, if we are a protagonist, if I may, is not overcoming the conflict. Yeah, man. That is a tragedy. Now, the Judas tree, I think, as our protagonist has entered into the comedy because I think it has overcome the conflict, even though it has this connotation of basically uh, being the the representative of Judas, who is the betrayer of Jesus for, I think, like 30 gold coins is what I read, and which at the time is a pretty big amount. I mean, it's not as big as 30 golden cones, but, I'd, you know. I'd consider it. Yeah, you can consider it. Uh, so I'm sure that it gets vilified for that, but... Every single year, the Judas tree still blooms its gorgeous flowers, and it still puts out its lovely little hangy things, and it still grows up and becomes a gorgeous, if not gigantic, still a lovely proportioned tree. Yeah. I think that is absolutely admirable. I love the color. I love the bark. One other thing, Alex, I think I like about this tree. Hmm. For whatever reason, the eastern redbud, when we plant it here in Oregon— yeah consistently, or at least anywhere, I don't know if just Oregon, I guess in Seattle also, uh, they consistently get a Ganoderma decay at the base of their tree. Ganoderma. Yes, it's one of the fungus that we have, we've talked about it a couple times. Okay. Uh, it pops out, and it's this big uh, uh, polypore, so it has a conch that comes out. Conchs. Yeah, and you can you can scratch on the bottom, Ganoderma aplanatum. Oh, yes. Yeah, so you can, you can it, draw on it. Yes, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I find more of those on the bases of redbud trees than mm. any other tree I've ever seen, at least in sort of a consistency basis. Are those fatal? Uh, yeah, they will be over time because okay. they, they are saprophyte. They decay the middle of the dead wood of the oh. stem. So over time, that basal decay will cause the tree to just fall over because gotcha. it's lost its structural support. Okay. I, I love that. I love that I can look at a... I know of one right now in my brain on Division Street <laughs> that I can point to. You freak. And I just love being able to walk down and be like, hey, there's a red bud. It's really beautiful right now. Oh, there it is. There's yeah. that fungus. I wow. don't know. I just, okay. for whatever reason, it tickles me. It's every dependable. Time. It's dependable. I'm going to give the Red Bud a 7.1 on the golden scale of cones because I think that I think that it's earned it. I think it's a okay. funny tree. I think it plays a weird place uh, in in our in our world, and I don't know if anyone acknowledges that quite as much. Hmm. I don't know if anyone is like the Judas tree, huh? Why do you why do you call it that? And then dig into it a little bit. You may be the and first, Casey. I, I don't think so. I think other people have. I read this on Wikipedia actually. Oh, so someone's what is, what is that? Oh, it's this interesting little blog. I'll check it out. Anyway, seven point one golden cones of honor. Yeah, An- golden ancient go- cones of honor. Yes, uh, inscribed on stone tablets. Correct from theologian Casey Clapp of the Judas Tree. Casey. Alex. <laughs> I love when we do that. What do you think? <laughs> um, I don't really know because this episode wasn't really about the Judas tree. Mm. So uh, I don't really have an opinion on it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I failed at my job. I'm teasing you. <laughs> um, I like the Judas tree. Yeah, I, I, it, gets, it gets bonus cones for me immediately for having that thing where it grows 
flowers on ah, its fucking trunk. Call a flory. Call a flory. That yeah. is so wacky and interesting. Mm-hmm. And it's such a cool look. I mean, it, it looks like somebody pinned flowers on the trunk. That's exactly what it looks like. Uh, yeah. To commemorate the death of Judas. <laughs> um, I... Oh, I th- other be- than that, it's kind of a it's kind of whatever for me. However, oh. it is linked to this big, you know, I love a tree that has some standing in mythology. Yes, that is true. Uh, or or culture at large. Yeah. Um, how how much bigger culture can you get than the Bible? <laughs> so I'm I'm down with that. And for me, it's probably it's residing around a six point oh. Ah, uh, a six point oh. It's, it's not. Sim- it's not a. Yeah. It's it's not sub five. It's not. It's not uh, over seven for sure. All right, that's fair. Six point oh feels feels good for you me. You know, one day we should go out and try to find all these trees mm. and specifically find them at their at their peak of whatever sure. is like whatever puts one of us higher than the other, you know? Yeah. Like, like we should go out and find a mango tree when it has a bunch of ripe mangoes on it. And I'll yeah, eat we those. should. And then we should take it out to the, to find a Judas tree in full bloom and just yeah. see if it changes our, if like the grandeur of it, like makes us be like, Oh wow. I'm almost positive. 7.2. All of our trees would get like a three cone bump. If oh, we did yeah. this, yeah, you know, you're probably right. If experiencing any of that stuff in the wild is, is so much better than just talking about some Google images, which I have to say probably makes us very good, uh, reviewers in that case. Mm. It's just to our own flu here. That makes us able to not see the grandeur and be put off and be like, it's so beautiful. We we're way more objective here. Oh at, yeah. This at completely is completely arbitrary. This has all been on purpose yeah. for sure. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> that was our review of the Judas tree. Casey, it's time for a game. It's one we haven't done in a long while. Oh boy. This is who can it tree now? <laughs> who can it tree now? 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 All right, Casey. Here's how the game works. I am thinking of a tree. You have 10 questions. Mm. And I'm also I'm considering setting a timer. We'll see how that how it goes. Oh shoot. Okay. I might get I might be like, "All right, 3 minute warning." Okay. Um you have 10 questions. Okay. Yes or no questions to One, ask me. Yes or no. Okay. I will answer you from the pages of the Sibley Guide to Trees by David Allen Sibley. Okay. Honestly, so this tree still is in here. Looking for that money, David. <laughs> David owes us like three million dollars, probably. I think so yeah. Um, you have ten questions. Yes or no to deduct what tree okay. I am thinking of. Okay. Please take off your headphones and plug your ears and I will tell our listeners the tree in question. Okay, I'm doing it right now. The tree in question is Cedar of Lebanon. Okay, Casey. All right. I have the page open here with the tree in question and you now have 10 questions. All right. I'm going to start like I always do. Yeah. Is this native to Oregon? Uh, Uh No. Oh, okay. I shouldn't have done that. Is it native to the United States of America? No. It is a non-native tree, is what I've deduced from my questioning. Ha <laughs> ha. That's very Western-centric of you, Casey. Thank you. It's because, Alex, I know them better, so I have to sometimes <laughs> just play to my strengths. Okay, is it a conifer? It is <gasps> a conifer. Oh, my God. Okay, it's a conifer. It's not native. It's in the Sibley Guide to Books. Okay, is it... It in the <laughs> Sibley Guide to Books. <laughs> Sibley Guide to Books, <laughs> where he, <laughs> where he just is a library of books. <laughs> he illustrates every book in print. Man, that guy has a lot of free time. <laughs> Hard right. left turn from nature. <laughs> yeah, it really did. He really, he really went all, uh, all uh, academic on us. <laughs> all right. Uh, so that's three questions. My you fourth think, question. Do you think the Sibley Guide to Trees is in the Sibley Guide to Books? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it. I think it has to be. <laughs> question number four, Alex. Yeah. Is it in the Pine family? Should be at the top of the page. Uh, yes. It is in the Pine family. Okay. Is, does it have needles in multiples greater than one? What is that? That's question five. 
Uh, I'll rephrase. Are the needles singly blown? Right. Yeah. Okay. Or are they like a? Is it like a three needle pine or a five needle pine? Is that what you're asking? Uh, well, so there's a the yes or no version of that. Exactly, because there's also there. Well, there's the there's the pines that have it in two, three, and five, and then there's also um, species like the larch and the cedar that have them in bundles of multiple, where there's like twenty or thirty or forty. Um. So singly born would be just one comes off here, one comes off there. I'm unable to answer this question. Oh my god! And I can't tell you why, but I'll tell you why after. Holy heck! But it's in the f- it's in okay, but it's in the pine family. So. Yes, but I'll give you that question back if you want to ask Ooh, a def- okay. different I'll one ask for a your different fourth. Question. Okay, um, do the cones hang down pendulously? Do they hang down low? Do they wobble to and fro? Yeah, are they uh, ugly like a dog? Would you take them like a polywog? <laughs> close dang it uh they do not hang down ah so they stand up okay you're getting closer aren't number you? five i think so is this tree um deciduous i don't believe so question number six that was all right question number seven is this tree uh in the genus cedrus it is. Wow. Okay. All right. That's question number seven. Wow. I'm so close. Now on question number eight. The final three. You know, we should have the we should have that doom 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 that that uh why yeah. who wants to be a millionaire music when, oh. when they're in the final uh, questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's really intense. It totally does. The lights kind of come down a Maybe little I'll, bit. Yeah. Maybe I'll yeah, try to find that. Swishes around. I'm gonna put it in right here. Okay. Oh, question wow. seven? Question, uh, I'm on question eight. eight. Okay, Alex. Is this tree generally a light, uh, almost blue color, or is it a darker, greener color? Ooh, the foliage? That's, that wasn't a yes that's or no a, question. Also yes or no. I'm just going to leave it at a, it, is a foliage color light blue? No. Is this tree... From the Himalayas. No. You have one question left. Is this tree... It's also possible I've misanswered one of these and you're on the wrong trail. Mm, But this is your last question and then you must guess. Here we go. Who can a tree now? Is this tree Cedrus brevifolia? It is not. Is this tree? That was question nine. Yes, this that was, is this is no, question, no, no, I think that was, was question ten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now I have to guess what you it now is. must. This is your final guess. This is the guess. Casey Clap. Not a question. Who can it tree now? Cedar of Lebanon. Casey, you have one. Who can it tree now? Yes. Oh God, man, this one feels so good. Yeah, <sighs> boy. <sighs> Well, Casey, you nailed it this time. Well yes. done. The Cedar oh, of Lebanon. Oh, 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 I chose oh, it thematically oh, oh. for today. It really was good. It's a very biblical uh, themed thing. Yes. Yeah. And let us end with a prayer. And by prayer, I mean the completely arbitrary Q&A. All right. This week's question is from Claire. Hi, Claire. Hello. Claire says, today I was watching The X-Files and I'm so curious as to whether something a park ranger guy is saying is true. One of the characters in the episode, Casey. Mm-hmm. Do tree parasites only attack the living parts of the tree? Yeah. For context, in this episode, an unknown entity, maybe a tree mite, is cocooning humans and behaving in some non-tree insect ways. Any light you could shed on this would be appreciated. Claire, thank you so much for the question. Casey. I love this question. This is such a good question. Do tree parasites only attack the living parts of the tree? Exactly. And one thing that I love is is funny. Uh, Claire also adds, and also some parts of the tree are dead, which I I love. There's two question marks on that, which I I hear like a dramatic like... (gasps) I guess heartwood is dead, right? Exactly, yeah, yeah. So this is question. So, oh my gosh, yes. The answer is emphatically no. (gasps) 
tree parasites do not just attack living parts of the tree. Exactly. They don't care. They, it depends on the parasite. Oh, sure. So, not every parasite is alike. Precisely. Earlier this episode, we talked about Ganoderma aplanatum. That is a fungus yes. that decays wood. But if the wood is living, like the very outer cambium layer, it can defend against that. Fungus is considered a parasite? It is, yeah. Oh. You have parasitic fungi like... Oh, sure. I guess I knew that. Yeah. I, I thought, I when I say, when I think parasite, I'm, I think little insect. Totally, yeah. But fungus can do it as well. There you go. We have parasitic fungi. They will get on something and eat it and attack it while it's living. Yeah. And it will live in and on that tree. And that's what it does. There are other parasites or other fungi that are saprophytic that only decay the dead things. So uh, the red belt polypore is one. Mm. It will grow only on a dead log. If you see that that conch coming out, that tree is dead. It okay. doesn't grow in any other living trees. Or if it does, it's like in a really weird situation where it found some weird dead wood. Mm. Which brings us to our next point. Trees <laughs> do have living and dead parts. And I say dead because trees are still so wildly unknown that it's very difficult to like uh, figure this out. Sure. So the, the official way to see it is that the inner heartwood of a tree is functionally dead. It's inert wood. It doesn't have any function in the tree anymore. I think calling it inert is more appropriate than calling it dead. I think that's fair. Yeah. I think in a scientific way, inert is more like it doesn't react to anything. Yeah. But in a tree, it still kind of does. Mm. Where if you injure a tree deeper into the heartwood, that wood will still have a chemical reaction and will still put up the coated walls to help keep decay from going any further the heartwood specifically yeah yeah any any wood inside that tree if you affect it or you gouge way into it it will have some kind of reaction whether it's a, just a small chemical reaction or something bigger i have a new proposal for what to call this instead of dead instead of inert okay we call it retired yeah that's a great idea alex it's a retired wood yeah yeah it, it put in its time it's done its <clears> effort <throat> now it's just going to sit there and let the next generation build on top of it but if it gets a, a call from its former boss a, a, a mission it cannot refuse exactly it will go back into service it will go back into service yeah. god you're good well done so um so yeah so that was but you know the common term is everyone says yes it's dead you also have dead branches that come on or that are still hanging on different yeah. kinds so those dead branches could get the saprophytic fungi attacking that dead wood and because it's still on the tree could you technically call that a parasite well i don't know however the other kind of parasites are uh tree Insects and things like that. So you have mites, you have nematodes in the soil, you have um, different uh, flying and sucking insects that get on the leaves, and then you have insects that bore into the bark, into the wood, and eat the cambium layer, mm. or the actual wood itself. Okay. There are also other things that uh, you might be able to say, like an ant. If an ant is living inside of a tree, it's mining out the decayed area of the heartwood, Ants don't ever go and attack healthy trees and healthy wood. Ah. They don't do that. It's a common misconception. They will eat out the dead and decayed wood on the inside, and that's where they will make their house. Is that because it's softer? It's easier to get yeah, through? that's exactly right. They yeah. can't chew through sap wood necessarily? Yeah, and because it's covered in sap, they will actually literally get oh. pushed out, and sap will cover them. That's what trees do if a bark beetle gets in. Mm. You see this little pop of sap kind of push out, and that is the tree basically saying, nope, and just spits it out. You know what this reminds me of? Ants going straight for the unsapped wood. Ah. It reminds me of the Rebel Alliance when they send in X-Wings to blow up the first, de the first Death Star. Why is that? Tell me. Well, they they don't go for a full frontal attack because ah. the Death Star is covered in cannons and mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. a bunch of TIE fighters and yeah. stuff and is itself a huge weapon. They got to go into the middle. They go a little sneaky route into the middle and they attack that yeah. and uh, game over. Hey, it's good enough for me, Alex. So, in this case, the, the answer to this question, which I, I just loved, I thought it was a fantastic question, yeah. is yes, rather no. <laughs> uh, so, the answer to the question is no. Yeah. Tree parasites do not only attack the living parts of the tree. They will go in and attack the dead parts, and they will live in that. The fungus will decay the entire old, technically or whatever, dead parts of that tree and live in it for many, many decades, centuries sometimes. There you the, go. The rest of the tree on the outside lives. It just depends on the parasite. Thank you, Claire, for your question. If you have a question about trees, email us at arbitrarypod at gmail.com. That's A-R-B-O-R-T-R-A-R-Y pod. Join us on Patreon if you want to support this podcast. There are tiers at one, five, and ten bucks a month. 
Join the Arboretum to get two bonus episodes a month about trees and other related topics, or the Cone of the Month Club to receive a unique die-cut cone sticker illustrated by an independent artist sent to you every month in your mailbox. Casey Clapp. Alex Croson, thanks for sticking with me through this. Casey, we should say again, we are currently doing a fundraiser of sorts for Indigenous Women Rising, which is an organization that provides uh, health care to Indigenous and Native women, um, uh, including right now, including abortion. Yes. Uh, which is uh, very important right now to support. If you want to support this cause, either donate to them directly, but we are also doing a sticker sale. 20% of all sticker proceeds for the rest of the month will go to this organization. So check out arbitrarypod.com slash stickers. No coupon code or anything. Just buy the stickers and your money will be delivered. That is right. Thanks everyone for listening and supporting and help each other out. Rough times out there. So make sure to give someone a hug and also talk to your neighbors. Talk to your friends. Make sure everyone's okay. I like talking to you every week, Casey. Oh, Alex, it's mutual. It really is. It'd be cool if we were talking about like music or movies or something. But. Hey, uh, I think we're going to be talking about that a little bit more. Uh, you got other things happening, too. Is an EP coming out? Oh, sure. I, this was not a setup to talk about I my, know, my but, new album. But I love to take advantage when I see All one. right. You little sneaky son of a gun. All right. Let's get out of here, guy. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of Completely Arbitrary. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Completely Arbitrary is produced by Alex Croson and Casey Clapp. Our artwork is by Jillian Barthold, and our music is by Aves and the Mini Vandals. And you can support the podcast at patreon.com slash arbitrarypod. And find additional readings at completelyarbitrary.com. Thanks for listening. 